Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Test Pilot channel. And happy Black Friday! As I'm releasing this video, it is the day after Thanksgiving 2023. And although Thanksgiving is past, I think it's still okay to do a Thanksgiving themed video. After all, you're still probably feeling the after effects of overindulgence yesterday. <laughs> you're still hopefully enjoying a four day weekend as I am. And also hopefully you're thinking about all the things that you can be thankful for because as messed up as this world are, we still have a lot of good things in our lives and wonderful people in our lives, of course. I grew up believing that Thanksgiving was America's most noble holiday. After all, it celebrates peace and cooperation between two very different cultures who came together in harmony to enjoy food and fellowship at a time when so many people had died, when, when there had been such hardship for both groups. How could anybody find fault with this holiday? Well, in the present day, anything is possible. And of course, if it is possible, it will happen. And yes, people are condemning Thanksgiving of all things. And this is partly because the pilgrims, who were once revered as noble and principled religious dissenters from England, who did their best, actually, to live with the natives, they're now being reviled as racist, as thieves, as even murderers. Their arrival in 1620 gives kind of a landmark for the 1619 Project by the New York Times. It's this journalistic thing where they're talking about how bad America was. And I think they're mostly focusing on slavery, but I have no doubt that they get around to mentioning the natives too. A lot of people say, maybe this is a little biased. You know, maybe you're going a little too far. I mean, in the past, we didn't hear the bad things that our ancestors have done. I mean, as, you know, as the majority, as the as the white middle class majority that so many of us are. And true, we should hear both sides, but should we be told that we have to be shamed and uh, and remorseful and all these things? You know, and plus, are these things true? Were the pilgrims really bad people? Is this revisionist history the real story, or is it more complicated than that? Could these woke critics be cherry picking all the worst parts to make them look bad? I mean, you can do that with anybody. The most saintly person. I mean, I've seen things attacking Mother Teresa, saying that she was a bad person. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can do it to anybody. In preparation for this Thanksgiving, I have read several books on the topic, both nonfiction and fiction. Now, there's not as much fiction as you would think, you know, concerning that era, you know, way back around the time of the first Thanksgiving, although there is a fair bit, but I thought I'd start with nonfiction because I really didn't know that much about it. And I found a pretty good one that was a, a narrative, all based on historical fact, uh, that could kind of bring me up to speed, and I hope to bring you up to speed too. And uh, this first book is called The Mayflower, A Story of Courage, Community, and War by Nathaniel Philbrick, published in 2006, Penguin Books. This is a fascinating and very balanced and fair history told from both sides, the pilgrims and the natives that they encountered. The history of the former is well known because the pilgrims like to write stuff down. <laughs> they like to record things and they like to send letters back to their, you know, compatriots in England. So we know a lot about that. We don't know as much about what the natives thought, but there are some surviving tribes left in New England. And the author contacted some of their leaders and discussed their oral traditions to try and get both, you know, the other side of the coin so to speak, and I think he did a pretty good job of it. This book is written chronologically, almost like a novel, although it's not fictionalized. I mean, it's the best of his ability, and he doesn't really use 
quotes except when he can find a source for it. So if, you know, if Miles Standish said something, yeah, that's in there. I took away several important points from this book. The first is that the pilgrims, who were actually Puritans, you know, at the time when I was a kid, I would confuse the two. I thought they were distinct. It just happened that the pilgrims were the first group to come over. And the uh, Puritans, as we called them, founded Boston. And so they were essentially the same church. Anyway, these pilgrims, they faced serious discrimination back in England. And so a lot of them went to the Netherlands, but they found their children were starting to get assimilated into Dutch culture, and they didn't want that. They wanted to keep their own culture and their own religion and have their own way. So that's why they went to America. And the second was how difficult the first years in America were. They were extremely trying. The first winter, half of the original settlers died, mostly from disease, uh, because the weather was very harsh, it was very cold, uh, especially the climate had taken a turn for the colder at the time, and they were kind of short of food, so people were malnourished, and if people are malnourished, they tend to succumb to disease. And because of that, they were just lucky to survive, and that's part of the reason that Thanksgiving was about Thanksgiving. The third point is that the pilgrims viewed the Native Americans that they encountered as God's children. They wanted to bring them the good news of Jesus and so on to save them. I know we may view this in this day as kind of imperialistic, you know, as colonialistic, but seriously, they wanted these people to be saved. So you can't say that they had bad intentions from that. There's a lot of ink been spilled over the pilgrims' missteps in those early years. They were human. They made a lot of mistakes. The first one, which I don't consider to be a mistake, is how they stole a buried cache of Indian corn. This is true, but there were extenuating circumstances. They were literally starving to death, and this corn helped them survive the winter. Uh, secondly, they were concerned about the morality of this action, and they decided that they would pay the owner back if they ever found them, and they did. Thirdly, at the time, the area had been very depopulated by the buponic plague. Yes, it was another horrible disease that uh, Europeans unwittingly bought, brought to the continent, and they were, you know, I, at about like one-third or so of the original population just a few years before, so who knows? The original owners could have been dead. As it happens, they weren't. And as I said, the pilgrims paid them back. The second argument they often focus on is what was known as King Philip's War. Because a few years after this wonderful Thanksgiving, there was a war between the uh, English and the natives. And it was a very bloody war, and it ended very badly for the natives especially. Now, what they don't say is this was 50 years later. So for the most part, they were at peace for 50 years, which is amazing for these two very different groups. I mean, you may say that diversity is our strength, but as you look at all diverse societies throughout history, it's always difficult. There's always conflict. Like look at Lebanon, for example. Some very different groups sharing that country. How peaceful do they fare there? Not very. <laughs> So it's not just us, you know, it's not just us that are saying, oh, we don't like these other people. No, humans tend to have that kind of kind of viewpoint that we want to rule. And if there's other people in our way, you know, we're going to fight with them. So the fact that they were peaceful at all is very amazing. So I'll talk a little bit about Th King Philip's War a little later. So my point is that the pilgrims, at least the first generation, were not in any way racist. They were fiercely loyal to their friends and brutal to their enemies. So they first met this chief, Poconocet, Poconoc <laughs> chief called Massasoit. They made friends with him, became allies, and he helped save them that first year. And they later saved his life when he was sick with the flu. They came and several people stayed at his village and helped him survive. 
By the same token, if you became their enemy, you had to watch out <laughs> because this was a struggle for survival. For example, they preemptively assassinated another chief, another sachem, as they were called, uh, who was threatening war, and they had this intelligence that they felt he was going to try to wipe them out along with other bands. Now, this was pretty underhanded the way they did it, but again, they were struggling to survive, and they rewarded their friends and punished their enemies. You know, there was, you know, some other horrific incidents. There was one in which Massachusetts Bay, that is the Bostonians, were going after this hostile tribe, and they, pilgrims, helped them massacre this village. Well, the natives had massacred English villages as well, so it wasn't like it was a one-sided thing. I mean, but for the most part, they were at peace, and with these particular tribes, particularly who had, you know, been friendly to them, and a lot of those Natives became Christians. They called them the Praying Indians. For me, the most fascinating part about this book was the portrayal of the notable Native personalities such as Massasoit. He was an amazing man. And there was another character we learned about in school. They never said much about him, except he was a good guy who helped out the pilgrims. His name was Squanto. Actually, that's short for Tysquantum, however you say that. And he was the first native that they really dealt with. He had a fascinating history. He was captured by Thomas Hunt, an English explorer who sold him into slavery. And yes, that was terrible. And the pilgrims themselves said, yes, this was terrible. This was horribly an immoral act uh, to take this innocent man and sell him. Well, he ended up in Spain. In Spain, some monks bought him and some other slaves to free them all these horrible white people, freeing slaves. <laughs> and uh, he ended up going to England. So he learned about Christianity. He learned Spanish and English and all these languages. So he was a very smart man. He came back to America and discovered that most of his tribe had died from the plague. Now, you know, obviously he must have been heartbroken, but at the same time, he resolved to, you know, do the best for the rest of his people and to become a leader among the area. And the way he's going to do that is by allying with the English. So he was the consummate politician and was fascinating to hear how smart and adept he was. Third guy, I have to mention, of course, is King Philip. He was the son of Massasoit and who you know, had the falling out with the pilgrims. And he was a sachem, a chief. The English called him king because... Uh, he was trying to lead all these different bands. Now, his real name was Metacom. <laughs> a very cool name. Sounds like a transformer. But he also had this English name, Philip, because a lot of the natives did this at the time. So many of them had become Christians, and they would adopt an English name at that point. He was very disgruntled about what he felt like a raw deal. There were some bad land deals. He felt like they'd been shafted. And they did you know, the pilgrims actually did pay for the land. Whether they always did it fairly or not is another question. Um, but the natives were not dumb like you want to, like some of the progressives want to say they were. They were actually fairly crafty at times, and the technology that the English gave them, like guns and, and uh, metal tools and uh, medicines and horses, were very important to their future way of life. So it's not a one-sided thing. But anyway, Philip was very disgruntled, and he made war on the English, which was a horrible mistake for his people. Uh, at the same time, the English, that is the pilgrims and the Puritans, in fighting back, they made some terrible mistakes too. One of them was to declare war on the Narragansetts. It was another tribe that would have been neutral, hostile, and originally they had been hostile, and they'd had this uneasy truce. And so they figured, well, if they're not going to be with us, they're against us, <laughs> kind of like George Bush. <laughs> and so they attacked the Narragansett village and made another enemy, which made the war a lot longer and bloodier. So this was 1675 to 76. And even the white colonists, they lost, like, I forget what the author said, like 10 to 20% of their whole population which is very horrible in war. Of course, the natives did a lot worse, a lot of survivors, 
were, uh, you know, as enemies, as defeated enemies, they were sold to slavery in the Caribbean. And as bad as that was, that was something that was done all the time back then. Cromwell did it to the Irish who fought against him. They were sold into slavery in the Caribbean. So it wasn't a racist thing. Now, Philip was an interesting character. He was a leader. He was very eloquent, but at the same time, he wasn't known as being that brave. He would kind of disappear when the battle started. And some of his fellows would say, Philip, fight, fight. Come on, man, fight. <laughs> and so, you know, the Nathaniel, the writer, doesn't out and out call him a coward, but it does sound like he wasn't the bravest man in the world. It was a fascinating book. I very highly recommend it. It tells you everything you need to know about the pilgrims, about the basics of how they survived and how they helped found this country, and the good and the bad. And, you know, a lot about the natives, too, and, and how they suffered, and, and they made mistakes, too. You know, if they would have stayed united and not fought each other, things would have been very different. Now, of course, I'm going to do other books on this show, and I like to concentrate on fiction. There is not a lot of fiction about this era. Well, there's, I guess there's plenty, probably. There's plenty of everything. But I wanted to look at the most prominent ones first. And the first that leaps to mind is The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne in 1850. Another Nathaniel. <laughs> this takes place in the Puritan colony of Massachusetts Bay. Uh, that's Boston. From 1642 to 1649. So it's right around that time. The protagonist is a woman named Hester Prynne who has been sentenced for adultery because she gave birth out of wedlock. You know, at that time, that was pretty dang scandalous. And she has been actually held in prison while she's pregnant, had to give birth to her baby in a jail cell. After that, they release her and her baby daughter, but she is sentenced to wear this red letter A on her bosom to remind everybody of what an evil sinner she is. Also, this is partly because she refuses to re reveal the father. And, you know, as time goes by, you kind of figure out who it is pretty quickly. Because, <laughs> it's, you know, it's the irony. And at the time, perhaps it wasn't a big deal. But to a modern reader, it's per kind of pretty obvious who the father is, even before the author reveals it. <laughs> and also to complicate matters, the husband... Uh, Hester's husband shows up. Now, this is why it was adultery, because she was actually married uh, to this other guy who never showed up. You know, she went ahead with a different boatload, and he was supposed to tie up some things in England and then come later. Well, as it happened, he never showed up. After the trial, you know, when she's being sentenced to wear the A, there he is. And uh, he says, to her later on, you know, on the down low, he says, I forgive you, but do not reveal my secret. I'm going to be living as a different name. I'm, I'm going to be living as a doctor because I have this medical knowledge and, you know, they need a doctor. So, you know, just let's just keep this between you and me. And it turns out he's up to no good, of course. And, and, you know, part of the ending is tragic and part of it is empowering. I mean, Hester is, you know, though so she puts up with this crap, she's a very strong woman in the context of that day. And she really kind of defies their willingness to make her into a uh, persona non grata. And I think it, it was in a way of an early feminist novel, if you think about it. <laughs> so it's an interesting book. Not that long. I recommend it to everybody. At some point in our history, all American school kids probably read it. Nowadays, probably not. Last book I'm going to talk about is a long poem called The Courtship of Miles Standish. This was published in 1858 and it's by the great poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And I remember my mom quoting this, so I have no doubt that, that she had to learn it in school as well. I, that I, it gives me a fondness for it. Um, but anyway... It's set in 1621, the year after the pilgrims arrived. And it concerns a love triangle between the titular Miles Standish, he was the stolid, tough captain of the militia of the pilgrims, 
and the very bookish friend of his, John Alden, who is uh, in love with the beautiful maiden Priscilla Mullins, as is Standish. And so they're both vying for her heart. And, you know, the story goes through in verse, <laughs> uh, written about how they both want to woo her, but Alden is kind of deferring because he thinks, well, Standish is a hero and I don't have the right, etc. But, you know, Priscilla has other ideas. So eventually, I'm going to spoil this, <laughs> Alden and Priscilla marry and give rise to a uh, family line that includes Wadsworth Longfellow himself. And at least he says that it's true and that this was a family tradition about how this was happened, how this happened. And uh, other people dispute the historicity of it. But, you know, according to the Mayflower book, a lot of the things that happen in this poem, a lot of the incidents are true, really did happen. So if it is fictionalized, and it is to some degree, it's still very good fiction with a uh, very good grounding in actual history. By the way, before I close this video, I'm going to talk about a, another book that I read that I'm going to review on my own blog, which is voluntrody.com, because I don't normally review political books in this channel, even though I get a little political sometimes. And it's called Not Stolen, The Truth About European Colonialism in the New World by the non-woke historian Jeff Flynn Paul, Bombardier Books 2023. And it's kind of got me started on this uh, pilgrim thing because he does talk about the pilgrims among other incidents between the white colonialists and the Native Americans. And it's an interesting counterpoint to the 1619 uh, criticism stuff. And if you want to see my review, I will put the link in the description. And this is a way of ensuring that I write it. <laughs> since, since I'm doing this in advance, I'll be forced to write it so it, the link's actually there, right? So this has been my story about, or my video about, uh, the story of the Pilgrims and the Puritans, their role in American history, and some of the books, just a very few of the books, that concern this history, which... I think every American should be aware of that, you know, whether you're white or not, <laughs> because it is part of our history. It's a very complex history with a lot of, you know, human mistakes and triumphs and tragedies. And I very much urge everybody else to learn about that. It's unfortunate that so many people are so critical and they, they want us to wail and gnash our teeth and cover ourselves with ashes and wear sackcloth and all that stuff. But... You know, in reality, there's nothing wrong with our country that's not wrong with any other country. I mean, we have the right to be proud, too. We know we've been made mistakes also. And if we are united, we can protect our heritage and our people much better than if we are fighting and squabbling with each other. <laughs> so, that's my, that's my message of the day. So for now, please let me know what you think about this in the comments below, whether you like this occasional foray into history or whether you prefer me to stick exclusively to science fiction and steampunk in particular. Please like and subscribe and share uh, so that we can get out the good steampunk word. I will also list my works on Amazon so you can check them out and hopefully buy them. This will be in the description as always. For now, this is the Steampunk Test Brother saying adios amigos and happy Black Friday from the Steampunk Test Brother channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Mm -hmm.